Quite a few of the people come in here. <clears throat> okay, well, good afternoon, <clears throat> everybody. Uh, I'm Richard Morningstar. I'm the uh, founding director and the chairman of the uh, Global Energy Center here at the Atlanta Council. And on behalf of the uh, Rafi Hariri Center for the Middle East and director Fred Hoff uh, and the Global Energy Center, I'm pleased to welcome our distinguished participants uh, and speakers to the Atlantic Council uh, for this event, uh, <clears throat> which is Iraq's energy potential opportunities and challenges. The Atlantic Council is leading a new long-term council-wide initiative on Iraq, and it's being administered uh, by the Rafi Hariri Center and headed by Hariri Center Senior Fellow, Dr. Harith Hassan al, uh, al Karawi. Uh, and <clears throat> this initiative uh, seeks to look past the current narrow security lens uh, with respect to Iraq and to examine Iraq's developmental potential, including <clears throat> the need for inclusive politics, economic development, and a vibrant civil society. The initiative is playing a vital role by formulating a strategy that the international community and particularly the transatlantic community, uh, can take to foster such a future in Iraq. Today is the U.S. launch uh, of the Global Energy Center Deputy Director, Ellen Scholes, Ellen over there, her report on shaping Iraq's <clears throat> oil and gas future. Uh, it was originally launched in January at the Atlantic Council's annual Global Energy Forum in Abu Dhabi, and the report analyzes the political realities in Iraq and the state of oil and gas development, emphasizing that both, both oil and gas resources are crucial uh, to Iraq's future and economic recovery. The report had an excellent reception uh, at the forum where the issue was discussed with one of today's panelists, Louis Al-Khatib, uh, as well as His Excellency uh, Jabbar al awabi the Iraqi Minister of Oil, and Majid Jafar, uh, the CEO of Crescent Petroleum. And we're very pleased to be able to share it with you today and launch it here today uh, in the United States. Uh, our panelists, Dr. Al-Khatib, Dr. Al-Karawi, and Ellen, will discuss the future uh, of Iraq's oil and gas potential vis-a-vis -vis other producers in the global market, export opportunities, political challenges, such as the uh, relations between uh, Erbil and Baghdad, uh, the constitutional framework uh, of energy production and management, and the influence of political dynamics on the energy sector. Uh, Dr. Al-Khatib is the founding director of the Iraq Energy Institute and a fellow at the Center of Global Energy Policy at Columbia. Uh, Dr. Al-Khatib is an expert on energy security, economics, and politics in the Middle East, and he has over 20 years of experience in business development and public policy. Dr. Al-Karawi is a non-resident senior fellow at the Rafi Hariri Center here at the Council, and his research focuses on state-society relations, political transitions, and identity politics in Iraq and the Middle East, and he's currently writing a book on Shia, religious authority, and the state in post-Saddam uh, post Iraq. Alan Scholl, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> is the deputy director of the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center, and her work focuses on energy and geopolitics and energy, energy governance. And she's had 
much experience uh, in the think tank world in Germany, as well as related legislative experience, having handled an energy portfolio as committee staff uh, for the U.S. Congress and the Texas Senate. Um, we got her from a think tank in Berlin, but she's actually a Texan. Uh, <clears throat> so our panel today uh, will be moderated by uh, as you, Ambassador Fred Hoff, who I'm sure you all know, uh, the director of the Rafi Kariri Center. Uh, and Fred came to the Atlantic Council after a long and impressive career uh, in the Army uh, as a uh, private sector CEO uh, and as the very well-known Department of State diplomat focusing much of his attention on Syria and has focused on in his whole career on the Middle East, and he's written extensively on Syria and Arab-Israeli issues. I might say that Fred and I could challenge any two people in this room or anywhere in the world knowing the most names of baseball players from the 1950s. Uh, <laughs> I would like to remind everyone that it's true uh, that this event is on the record, uh, streaming live, and will be archived on the Atlantic Council's YouTube channel. So you can join the conversation on Twitter by following a, uh, at AC Global Energy and at AC Mideast and using the hashtag AC Iraq. So with that, I'll turn it over to Fred. Thank you, uh, Dick. Thank you very, very much. Uh, welcome, welcome to one and all. Thank you for uh, thank you for taking uh, the time to be with us uh, this afternoon. My name is Fred Hoff. I'm the director of the Hariri Center for the Middle East uh, here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, my modest role this afternoon is simply to uh, moderate a conversation between our uh, our three experts and then to oversee a uh, a question and answer period. Uh, uh, to which I hope we'll be able to uh, devote uh, considerable time. Uh, we'll avoid, uh, we'll avoid uh, speeches, opening statements, uh, and the like, and just, uh, and just go directly into a, a conversation here. Ellen, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Uh, first of all, congratulations on a, uh, on a superb report. Uh, recently, the, uh, the Iraqi uh, Minister of Oil of Oil has said that uh, has said that sort of the benchmark level of five million barrels a day in uh, production is uh, is within sight. What what in your view needs to be done to sustain this level and even move toward the uh, six million barrels a day that the uh, International Energy Agency's 2012 report uh, projected? Uh, what are the what are the the energy market and regional implications of Iraq reaching and being able to sustain this kind of level? Uh, so first of all, thank you so much, Ambassador Hoff, for the very kind introduction, and to all of you for being here. Um, I think when you look at something like a five million barrel per day and a six million barrel per day figure, the kind of first thing that needs to be said is that if you really look at what Iraq has managed to achieve over the last few years in terms of production increases, particularly in the context of a very challenging security environment, that it's achieved some pretty remarkable gains. Um, so with the exception of the United States, between 2011 and 2016, Iraq has mounted the biggest production increases of any oil producer in the world, um, which in and of itself is, is an achievement. That said, when you start talking about especially the six million barrel per day figure um, and you start distinguishing between capacity and actual production, I think things get a bit more difficult, some of which for reasons that have to do with Iraq, some of which have to do with reasons related to the global market. So for instance, there's an OPEC production curtailment agreement that's been reached between OPEC producers and non-OPEC producers, um, including Russia. And under the context of that agreement, Iraq has, at least theoretically until the end of 2018, a hard production limit of 4.35 million barrels per day. Okay. So in and of itself, the 2018 outlook, if you're looking in the context of the production agreement, is, is limited. Um, and then I think there are also two other big oil market factors to consider when thinking about this, one of which is shale, which I know is everyone's favorite hot topic. And having been outed as a Texan, I feel like it's Groundhog's Day <laughs> because I moved from Texas to DC to Turkey to Germany and back to DC, and we are still talking about shale 10 years later. Um, but I think it goes a long way of saying that, um, you know, it's, it's certainly impacted the um, upstream investment. It's impacted the types of 
projects that a lot of major producers are looking for. Um, and then the other kind of big hot topic at the moment is this concept of peak oil demand. And while I'm certainly not here to tell you that peak oil demand is imminent, the fact that we're having a conversation about this as opposed to the kinds of conversations we were having just a few years ago um, when investment in Iraq post-2005 really revved up really says something about the oil market dynamics uh, that Iraq is is facing at the moment. And then there, of course, there are internal factors that I think are well known that we'll get into in the yes, conversation. Definitely. Uh, one of the one of the things that I found uh, remarkable and uh, very interesting in your report is unlike uh, unlike many other analysts commentators, uh, you actually spent some some quality time looking at the natural gas issue and possibilities uh, in the, in the country. And and I understand that there is an objective to uh, actually stop flaring mm -hmm. by uh, by by 2021. Uh, could you could you give our audience a general a general sense of the uh, of the possibilities here, the obstacles? What what really needs to be done for Iraq to uh, capitalize on this on this possibility? Yeah, so I think the, the, the first point is that the, the flaring question is related to Iraq's associated gas, meaning that it is produced as a byproduct of oil production. And while Iraq has um, made several commitments and talked quite a bit about reducing flaring as part of the kind of uh, various global initiatives to do this, if you look at the oil production rise in the last couple of years, it's accompanied by a rise in flaring. Um, so on the one hand, flaring has increased uh, despite pronouncements, but on the other hand, there is obvious economic opportunity in reducing flaring. I think the World Bank puts the, the annual figures at a loss of 2.5 billion and a volume that could, in theory, um, meet a lot of Iraq's unmet power, uh, power needs, which Louie can talk about in greater detail than I can. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a huge opportunity to reducing flaring, which sort of has to be addressed through the right incentives to get companies that are operating major fields, which are responsible mm -hmm. for the vast majority of the flared gas, uh, to actually monetize that gas and capture it. So I think one set of questions is the type of incentives out there, and the other set of questions is really where that gas is going to go. Is it going to be used domestically? And if so, the development of a domestic market is one key set of questions, and export, which there's a whole other set of questions about export authority, but also export infrastructure. Terrific. Uh, Louie, your name was taken in vain there. Is there anything <laughs> you'd, uh, you'd like to add on the, just on the natural gas? Well, first of all, I would like to thank the Atlantic Council for the kind invitation. It's always great to be here in D.C. and meet friends and, and discuss some important issues. <clears throat> I had the privilege of um, peer reviewing your reports, and I think it's an excellent piece of work. I'm very glad that you cited me. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> the, in, in terms of like the energy play in Iraq, the, um, as um, Ella mentioned, um, on the production capacity and, and the actual production, uh, it's more or less very much uh, true. The, 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 um, the, there's always a dispute between the direct communication and the secondary source uh, between Iraq and OPEC. This will can remain a, um, um, an issue that uh, always get disputed between um, the, the various producers and, and OPEC member and uh, states as, as uh, with regards to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the accord that's signed between OPEC and non OPEC, however, it's kind of like uh, it was it was not the case anymore. Specifically after the Kirkuk issue, because production yeah. declined significantly. The um, with regards to the gas, uh, the, the the potential uh, of gases uh, will continue to be. Uh, um, um, huge for Iraq and also at regional <coughs> level when it comes not necessarily for the export but for the um, development of the petrochemical industry and for the potential of Iraq to um, to move beyond meeting local demand but also moving as an, as a, as an energy player at region, um, regionally speaking. The, um, the gas development at the moment, the, uh, the, the, the government, the Ministry of Oil succeeded in, uh, with the, the Shell um, joint ventures and, and, and the local efforts um, to um, monetize at least 950 million standard cubic feet of gas with plans to uh, monetize another 500 uh, um, million standard cubic feet um, of the um, of the associated gas mm -hmm. over the next 12 months. Um, this will require um, um, a continuous uh, investment and, and development from the um, Shell Mitsubishi South Gas Company joint venture. 
Um, the prospect of that to happen, it's, um, it's possible. Um, on the oil side, um, the, um, any increase uh, will be um, mostly split 50-50 between the national efforts as well as the, um, the IOC's contribution. Um, so um, the possibility of increasing another 500,000 barrels um, towards the end of the year, it could come 50% of the, uh, the oil fields that's managed by the national oil companies. Uh, currently, they stand around uh, 250,000 barrels, and this mm -hmm. could dub double, and uh, further increase from the from the IOCs. Okay. Uh, of course, this is subject to um, um, how serious uh, Iraq to move on Majnun in specific, mm -hmm. especially after the um, planned exit of Shell. Yeah. And um, also in terms of like how to manage the uh, Kirkuk production. The Kirkuk production will be uh, critical for the country and, um, and um, it's vital to kind of like come and stream and, and, and contribute to the revenue at federal I level. Have a, I have a very specific question on that, but first I'll, uh, first I'll waltz Ellen into this, uh, this uh, thin ice of, uh, oh, of politics and then we'll return specifically to Kirkuk. Sure. Um, an obvious political key to Iraq fulfilling this enormous uh, energy potential is the resolution of disputes between the government of Iraq and the, uh, and the KRG. Uh, in your view, what are the salient points of this energy relationship, Baghdad, Erbil? And is there, is there a feasible framework for the resolution of these disputes? So that is a very big question and one that uh, I'm sure many people in this room have worked on far longer than I have. But I think one of the, the key underlying points here is, you know, we're sitting on the stage as there is, call it a donor conference or an investment conference, um, but there is a gathering in Kuwait talking about Iraq's infrastructure and rebuilding needs, uh, putting the number somewhere between 85 and 100 billion. So at the end of the day, if we're talking about rebuilding the country and a foundation upon which to do it, the resources for um, energy revenue are going to be pretty critical. Um, and at the end of the day, one of the things that in the context of the international market, and we can go into more detail about that later, but I think when you're looking at the investment climate that we currently find ourselves in, um, for oil and gas specifically, you really need to create certainty for future and continuing investments. and one way to do that or one thing that would need to be resolved is this overhanging question of, of resource management and, and revenue sharing. Um, and there are any number of cases that can be pointed to and, and you can kind of draw a line between unresolved issues and either a brief uh, production stay, say in Chevron's case, um, you know, restarting its operations in Kurdistan in January, but, but taking a pause between October and, and January. Um, you can look at a lot of other investment decisions and, and say that you know investment certainty would be helped by perhaps the presence of a national hydrocarbons law. And I know that goes back to differing interpretations of the Constitution and, and really difficult questions. Um, but at the end of the day, if companies are reducing their upstream investment and uh, making those decisions based in part on payback time and in part on political risk, if there's still questions about the political dynamics and the legal dynamics and about payment, which is something we saw between 2014 and, and last year, um, then Iraq with unresolved political issues and potentially unresolved political issues which impact payment, um, uh, that doesn't bode well despite incredible low cost production. Okay, terrific. Well, uh, Louie, back to you then. And again, thank you for, uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us uh, today. Uh, picking up on the, uh, on the energy aspect of the Baghdad-Erbil relationship, uh, how do you assess the uh, potential future status of uh, Kirkuk and its, uh, and its oil? Uh, in your view, will Baghdad and Erbil find solutions for Kirkuk and other energy-related disputes, including those uh, related to the KRG's export of oil through its own pipeline network? Well, first of all, um, we have to make it clear that a fractured, a broken Kurdistan region of Iraq is no good for Iraq, mm -hmm. as simple as that. It has to be, we have to have a stable Kurdistan. Now, 
and, and, and vice versa. A fractured and, 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 and a kind of like unstable federal Iraq will be no good for the, for the security and the future of Kurdistan, of Iraq. Now, with regards to the disputes, many would always, uh, many would say that this is a constitutional misinterpretation uh, and um, the issues goes back to the 2006 before or after and so on. But in, in fact, it's not just the misinterpretation, it's the, unfortunately, the, the abuse of the, um, of the power from both sides, from Baghdad and Erbil. And the abuse of, of power in a way that um, it ended up that both parties um, deliberately blaming the, um, the issue of as if like in, uh, the constitution has been misinterpreted and resorting into what is called the political deals. And that's why what the key words that you always hear, uh, let's sit and make a deal. This is deal making is unconstitutional and unethical. <laughs> there is no such, if you want to, if, if Iraq really need to focus on state building, and when I say Iraq, let it be Erbil or Basra or Baghdad or whatever, they really need to think of adhering to the constitution. And adhering to the constitution is, is, is uh, seeking some, if they, they, if they don't understand the interpretation, they really need to seek uh, the support of experts in legal and in, 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 in any areas, but not lobbyist. Mm -hmm. They we have to differentiate between lobbyist and experts. Uh, uh, so, so if we really need, if, if we really need to kind of like move forwards, we have to think like when I say, when I say we is like, I always use my Iraqi hats. It, 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 this need to be kind of like resolved and not just resolved because, um, um, we desperately need the cash now and so on. Time is not on, our, on, on the side of oil producers. Technology is evolving by the day. New energy sources um, um, contributing the energy mix uh, from all over the world and it, it will, geoeconomies will be, will be the ones that reshape borders and uh, interests between countries, not the geopolitics. Yeah. And these are, the, these are the common interest. And we only have about 20 years to really invest every single day, every single uh, resource for rebuilding uh, Iraq. Now, when I say like in 20 years, I'm not saying that oil, the use of like the dependency on oil will evaporate completely. No, 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 it will remain mm -hmm. to play a significant role, but not necessarily the primary role uh, given the evolution of technologies yeah. and so on. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to escape your core questions in terms of like <laughs> the, the issues between Baghdad and Erbil, but the fact is that <laughs> politicians in Iraq really need to put this in mind. So far, with wrong policies, um, when Baghdad decided to well, manage to add 1.3, 1.4 million <coughs> barrels um, on, on the, the, the baseline plateau of 2009, it was about 2.4 million. Um, this came at a significant <coughs> cost. Yeah. It cost Iraq around 75 billion US dollars. When um, Erbil developed uh, the, 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 the oil industry uh, and the gas industry up north uh, with the investors community, it came at a, at a significant cost. And we're talking about significant debts uh, um, at external, internal debts, and so on. And uh, one would, uh, may argue that these debts because of like de not um, the, the, the lack of allocation of budgets or whatever, but we can always do the maths of how, many, how much uh, oil has been sold and so on. And we reconcile all these numbers and we see where these money gone. The, the thing is that without the right policies, without adhering to the constitution, both parties will lose. We have a population that increasing 3% th uh, at the rate of 3%. 30, 38 million people uh, will exceed 50 million in, 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 in less than 10 yeah. years. 
uh, we have uh, major deficits, very much a static in, in budget of above 20 percent, anything between 20 and 23 percent. We have a, a huge bill to pay for the like um, the people on the payroll. Three million people just the, 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 the approved list. But if we go like to the unapproved and the contractors and so on, it goes to 5.5 million or 5.7 million. This is, this is about 15% of the population on the payroll. 15% like on average, but for example, in Kurdistan, it could exceed 30, 35%. Mm -hmm. So you have like uh, very much, um, uh, this is kind of like unheard of. I mean, something going wrong. This needs to be corrected. And without uh, um, taking a, a long view and, and correcting policies at economic and, and energy prospect uh, and taking mm -hmm. the state building uh, and, uh, of Iraq as a serious matter, uh, without resorting to kind of like short-term political deals that only be born to die in a few days. Sure. And if yeah. you've gone into the history of all these political deals that never, they collapsed not much, not much in, in weeks. Yeah. Uh, there will be no resolve on this issue okay. and future generation and future government will bury that liability and, 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 and to deal with. Okay. And this could lead to a further fragmentation of the state. Well, let's, let's, let's focus for a moment then on, uh, on the country's energy infrastructure and the reforms and investment that are required uh, in your view to uh, develop and upgrade it. Uh, Ellen's report speaks of public-private partnership models. Uh, are there ways that governments, including the U.S. government and energy companies, can contribute in terms of new technologies to develop uh, the sector and its infrastructure? Well, Iraq before Daesh is different from Iraq after Daesh. Not in the political sense, I'm talking about the economic. Okay. The bill of reconstructing and developing Iraq, uh, according to the Iraq National Energy Strategy back in 2012, it was around anything between 1.3 to 1.5 trillion US dollars. Now add to this another 200 billion US dollars post Daesh, just to kind of like rebuild the uh, three provinces and the various districts and, and the other um, provinces that, affect, uh, that uh, was very much affected by Daesh and terrorism. And this is, I'm talking about like kind of like economic losses. I'm not talking about like restoring the heritage that's lost for good. Now, no donors will be able to sit together and donate these um, um, billions of dollars at time of austerity at global level. No investors uh, would think uh, um, to invest in a country if there is no f clear framework and easy uh, regulation and attractive environment. And when I say attractive, not what these kind of terms that only exist in the lawmaker and the head of the lawmakers in Iraq, but yeah. kind of like competitively. When I, why should I invest in Iraq, not in Saudi Arabia or the UAE or Kuwait or, or, or North Africa and so on? So if, if, uh, without identifying these uh, competitive advantage in Iraq and, re and, and create that environment, uh, it's going to be uh, impossible. It was back in 2009 when uh, I had um, um, a discussion with uh, the Natural Resource Minister um, and I said, the problem of Kurdistan is that you guys think in complete isolation of Iraq. When you sit with your counterparts in Baghdad and discuss policies, you just think of like barrel to barrel budgets. You should think like an Iraqi Kurd and ask for your right and the barrel and molecule of oil and gas in Basra because that flaring of gas and unnecessary burning of oil, you have right for it. And if, you, if we do the maths, you will be losing billion, more billions of dollars compared to the few dollars you're chasing Baghdad for. But you don't think like that. And without thinking, and that was like nearly 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. 
And if I would do the maths in terms of like how much Iraq has lost at the, at the national level, at the federal level, it's humongous. Yes, Iraq made um, about 800 billion US dollars worth of revenues since 2003 and now. But we also lost an opportunity of about 300 billion US dollars worth of like revenues in kind, like the flared gas, the oil that we, 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 we burn, 220 million, uh, so 220,000 barrels of oil that we burn um, um, across the country. This could be kind of, if we have the right environment for renewable, for gas to power and so on, we could, uh, we could do wonders. If there is some sort of like an agreement in developing a gas strategy, gas and power between Baghdad and Erbil, and for example, using the Khormor and Chamchamal things, yeah. and make use of that, this money could benefit both parties instead of like pushing Baghdad to sign multi-billion dollar deals with Iran or, or uh, rely on importing electricity from Turkey and so on. Uh, and instead, uh, the whole opportunity was hijacked in courts and dispute and things. There's so many things when we talk about policies, there's a complete lack of understanding uh, of how much Iraq has lost, like, Iraq, like in every single uh, aspect of it. So this needs to be kind of like carefully understood. Mm -hmm. And the problem we have in, 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 in Iraq, let it be at regional or, or, or federal level, is we hear about responsibility, but we don't hear about accountability. Officials um, are rewarded, I mean, the only, maybe the only place in, in, in the whole world where like unaccountable people get rewarded for higher positions. And, uh, and this, is, this is disaster. Uh, the, there is a complete misunderstanding of mismanagement and corruption. Parliamentarians chase for like small bills and commission, um, who, who paid commissions or who, did, who kind of like involved in these kind of corruption cases, which could cost the state about anything like in the hundreds of million or maybe a few billions. But what really kind of siphoned Iraq's um, total revenue is, is the mismanagement that really squandered the, hundred, the hundreds of billions of dollars. And, and, and those officials should be accountable. So uh, the question is that it be in the parliament in Kurdistan or at the federal level in Baghdad and so on, should hold officials on the basis of accountability. You failed to implement the right policy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you mm -hmm. should be accountable and you'd be judged. And not to kind of like, okay, you didn't receive a commission from this, then therefore you're clear. As if like this official is doing a favor for not uh, receiving kickbacks. No, I'm going to hold you accountable for ruin um, um, strategic, dis the ruin our future and wasting our revenue, our um, welfares, because you squandered these opportunities and, and revenues. So these right. things need to be taken into consideration. Terrific, thank you. Uh, and how does this, this, this leads into, uh, into one of your areas of great strengths? Uh, first of all, thank you for the superb work you're doing uh, directing the, uh, the Council's uh, Iraq initiative. Um, corruption, Decentralization; these are these are elements that uh, that are often uh, mentioned in the context of a broad reform agenda, and certainly governance reform seems to be a key requirement if Iraq is to get uh, the most possible out of these uh, out of these energy gifts. What what are the challenges and prospects here? I noticed that uh, you know one of the uh, a, a, a recent report rated Iraq, and I may have, the, may have the numbers wrong, but something like 166 out of 176 uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of corruption. What are the, uh, what are the challenges here? Um, first of all, thank you, Ambassador Hoff, for nice, the nice words. Always nice to be here. Um, as you said, I'm not, I'm not an energy expert, so I learned a lot from reading Ellen's report and listening to her and Tulo. I, um, yes, uh, institutional uh, reformations in Iraq is, a, is, an, is an important issue. Uh, just recently, we organized a workshop uh, that pr brought together officials from the federal, uh, regional, and provincial levels, um, lawmakers to talk about uh, institutional uh, reforms that are needed to be 
uh, implemented in Iraq. And uh, there was a wide agreement that uh, the constitutional and legal framework in, in Iraq uh, has many defects. Uh, it needs to develop further. I heard a number like from an Iraqi official saying that we need to uh, amend or issue 27,000 new law and regulations in order to um, to uh, reform the system to, uh, so that it is not anymore based on the f uh, previous highly centralized system. So uh, there is a lot that uh, needs to be done here. Uh, at the same time, when we talk about federalism, uh, federalism and uh, decentralization, uh, especially when it comes to the energy sector, we should also be careful. Uh, as a country that is highly dependent on oil, we're talking about a country that is uh, deriving uh, uh, about 90% of its governmental budget from oil revenue, there is a risk of uh, making the system uh, m uh, more uh, problematic uh, if you uh, further decentralize the authority over energy. Most of the oil dependent countries have a centralized system of management. Of course, with that, as, as Loi mentioned, that you, you need accountability, you need transparency, you need to limit uh, corruption. All those factors are important, but at the same time, you need an effective system to manage uh, resources. Uh, and a problem in the Iraqi institutional and constitutional framework that was formed after 2003, that it, it was, uh, it was formed with very little consideration uh, for the nature of Iraqi uh, economy. Uh, so you have institutions that are supposed to be decentralized, federal, the authority has to be devolved into those institutions, but you have an economic system that is centrally managed, that all your revenues have to go to Baghdad, and you have this very primitive di distributive machine. Baghdad gets their revenue and then distributed to the state institutions and to the other levels. So there is an uh, inconsistency between the, the nature of the Iraqi economy and the nature of the institutions, and you have to deal with this. Uh, many people are calling for further decentralization, which is good in, many, in, in, in several aspects. But when it comes to oil, I think more than uh, that effectiveness is more important than decentralization. One of the ideas that were circulated in the, in, in the past years was to establish some kind of council or a board uh, to supervise uh, energy strategy and um, um, Im implementation of new uh, energy contracts and investment, a council that is headed by uh, the prime minister, but also include representatives of the regions, of the producing provinces. Uh, uh, it should be accountable to the parliament, but this council will help also to avoid the very dysfunctional system of Iraqi bureaucracy. Most of investors you talk to, uh, they complain about uh, the, the many cycles that make working in Iraq very difficult. And if we are talking about developing energy sector and energy infrastructure, you need an effective institution. And I think such, uh, if we try to think a bit out of the box, not, not too much, but just a bit, I think such a, such a council will help to make the, the, the system more effective. Terrific. I wonder, I wonder if I might also uh, draw you out on something you, you pay a lot of attention to, and that's, <coughs> that's the overall uh, context of uh, political stability in which, uh, in which this sector uh, has to operate. Uh, what, in your view, are the principal challenges being faced by the government of Iraq <coughs> now? In terms of uh, in terms of overall political stability post ISIS, yes, uh, of course. If we're talking about de uh, the development of uh, economy and realizing Iraq's uh, energy potential, uh, stability is essential. Uh, as Louis mentioned, that no investors will be willing to go a country to a country that is not stabilized, that its system of governance is not uh, functional. Um, and I would say that also probably the next threat to Iraq's stability will not be coming from another jihadi insurgency, but probably from socioeconomic complaints and grievances. Uh, 
uh, Loi gave uh, some numbers now. Uh, we, we're talking about society in which uh, the percentage of those who are under 24 years old are 60%, and hundreds of thousands of them enter job market every year with the shrinking resources because of the plummeting of oil prices. There are less and less jobs for, for those people. We already saw protests in the south of Iraq, in Baghdad, in Kurdistan. So uh, this is an issue that, is, uh, that needs to be uh, tackled with an approach that uh, connects the stability agenda, the security agenda, to the de development agenda. Uh, as you mentioned, like, uh, of course, uh, there, is, there is some sense of optimism after the defeat of ISIS and the liberation of areas, the areas that were controlled by ISIS. Uh, the, uh, ISIS is weaker than any time since 2014. Uh, partly because there are other uh, uh, unstable fronts in the region that attracted the migration of jihadis. I Iraq is not their only or main front now. Uh, um, uh, also because when they decided to uh, turn from underground insurgency into trying to behave as a state and governing, they exposed themselves and they became more vulnerable. But we should also expect that they will make the uh, the, the remaining cells of ISIS uh, and jihadi groups, they will make the necessary adjust, adjustments to probably go back to their uh, previous tactics of terrorist attacks, car bombs, assassinations, mm -hmm. hit and uh, run tactics, just to make sure that uh, the country will not uh, further normalize the situation and further stabilize. So there is a need to change also the security approach from military, op military operations to, uh, to focus on intelligence. But the security, the security approach is only one dimension of it. You need uh, uh, to have a holistic uh, method in dealing with the post-ISIS areas, uh, the, the reconstruction, the return of, we're talking about two and a half million displaced people, the ret their return to their homes, the rebuilding of those areas, the, uh, the, the, the the economic uh, reform needed to create good, uh, uh, good business environment in those uh, in those areas, and, and actually in all in all of the uh, of Iraq, I would add also that uh, a, a threat that is going to be more serious in the coming years is the is the rise of armed non-state actors, uh, paramilitaries, militia groups. Uh, organized criminal, uh, criminal groups. Some of them work uh, parallel to the state. Some of them manage to infiltrate the state, creating what we call uh, hybrid actors that are mm -hmm. difficult to, uh, to discern uh, uh, their nature and uh, uh, simply their operations from the operations of state structures. and. Uh, for stability, you need a, a state strong enough to monopolize the, the so-called legitimate violence. And those groups are contesting the state and sometimes sharing with the state mm -hmm. uh, the use of that violence. And it, many of them are actually using violence to achieve political or economic benefits. Uh, and since we are talking about oil, uh, this is not only about militias and paramilitary groups. In, in, in areas where you have them most important oil fields in Iraq, in Basra, uh, and then Misan, Nasiriyah, you have uh, uh, a, a tribal armed groups uh, in those areas. And many of them use violence or threaten to use violence against companies, against uh, employ uh, people working there in, in, in oil facilities, either to get jobs for their, uh, for their own people or to extract resources from those uh, facilities, and there is a, a risk of the evolution of a whole structure of informal economy around oil fields that will make any, any plans for development uh, of those fields and yeah. the whole uh, energy infra infrastructure very difficult. Okay, uh, Hadith, finally, before we, before we turn to uh, questions, um, there is a national election pending. 12th of May, um, uh, your, the activity you head, the Atlantic Council Iraq Initiative, will be having a program, I believe it's yes. on April 25th, April, yeah. Yeah. Uh, here, uh, and, and it, that 
the whole electoral process will be much more in focus, I'm sure, at that point. But from what, from what you're seeing now uh, in the run-up to these elections, uh, are, any of, are any of the issues we've discussed today on the table being discussed? What do you think uh, in terms of uh, possible results on, uh, on May 12th? Uh, what, what potential impact could there be on, on reform agendas? Yeah, in an ideal Iraq, I mean, those issues should be the main uh, topics that are raised during the electoral campaigns. Uh, especially now, th this is the first election held after the, uh, the defeating of ISIS and after also the referendum crisis in Kurdistan. Uh, but there are not very good, uh, helpful indicators uh, judging on, on the electoral alliances that were formed so far. And we should remember also this election is also a referendum on, the, on Prime Minister Haider Abadi's performance and uh, his ability to, to form uh, a large coalition after the election to, co to, to secure a second term. So, um, the, uh, unfortunately, the programmatic issues, like issues about uh, economic reform, political reform, are not uh, high on the agenda of political parties or in the, in the discourse. There, 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 are, there are electoral slogans, of course, uh, talking about state building, talking about a strong state, talking about trying to, uh, 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 to provide jobs for the population and things like that, but never with very articulated program or plan that, uh, that is credible enough to, to try to, mm -hmm. to build on. Um, uh, all the talk about, uh, so, so my first sense of the election, is it will be uh, um, a process to reproduce the status quo. Uh, there is not much changes expected to happen, probably in the personalities and the names of officials, but not in the overall system of governance in, in Iraq. Um, all the talk that uh, we heard in the last few months about forming cross-sectarian or cross-ethnic alliance did not material, material, materialize. And I think Prime Minister Abadi seems to have missed the opportunity of building on the momentum he gained after the liberation of areas that were controlled from uh, by ISIS, and also after the referendum crisis in his Arab constituency, there was a very widespread impression that he managed to deal with this crisis uh, uh, effectively and successfully. Uh, so he had, his popularity was boosted, and many expected that he will come with a strong alliance, with a vision, with the strategic objectives, but uh, since he started like preparing for the election, he stumbled many times, and it doesn't, doesn't seem to me that he has a clear strategic uh, vision about uh, how to deal with the election. Now it is uh, very expected that uh, he might be the first in the election, His, he might come first uh, uh, in the results, but he, it is unlikely for him to uh, secure a majority or to be any, any close to the majority. So he will have to go through a painful process of compromises. Just, Thanks, please. Just, yes, just want to comment yes. on, on this. I think uh, <clears throat> if, you, if we would re if we reflect on every single election that took place post 2003 uh, and all the premiers that uh, were selected uh, and designated to form governments, uh, we could see um, the, 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 the one constant and that's the, so two constants and that's one is the compromise candidate. Uh, yeah. that comes from unexpected, unexpectedly to become the prime minister and, um, and the kind of like the consensus that rules the status quo or maintain the status quo. Uh, and e well, even the second term of Maliki, it was, uh, it was a, a compromise, an uncalculated compromise uh, that produced a compromise uh, uh, second term. Uh, so uh, this is very much constant. Now the, the bets on uh, Dr. Abadi are uh, quite high compared to other contenders. But uh, the, there is always the chance of witnessing a, a possible compromise candidate. The only difference from this election that, could, that we could witness uh, is, 
is the moving, uh, moving politics from consensus to majoritarian government or majorita majoritarian voting and decisions. So is the, maj the majority, but it has to be diverse and inclusive, the majority will shape the, the, the new phase of politics uh, from 2018 onwards. Uh, now, if this happens, we could see change in the political uh, sphere in Iraq. If this doesn't happen and back to the consensus, we could see more of the same and more challenges ahead. Terrific. Uh, Ellen, care to jump in on anything here or should we just go straight to questions? We can go to questions. Excellent. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a question, uh, please indicate by, uh, by raising your hand. Someone will come around with a microphone. Uh, please, uh, please identify yourself and, uh, and uh, articulate a question as succinctly as possible. Ambassador Morningstar. Thanks. Here comes Thanks the mic. Thanks for allowing me to ask a question. <laughs> uh, just first, a couple of comments and then two, two questions. Obviously, by any rational standard, uh, an agreement between Baghdad and Erbil on energy makes a lot of sense or makes total sense. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the obstacles. Uh, obviously, Baghdad and Erbil have a totally different picture of their uh, political of the political futures uh, of uh, their areas. Some of the other obstacles have come up with respect to potential continuation of terrorism and so forth. But one issue, two questions. One thing that has not come up at all is Iran, and. The question, main question I would have is it seems to me it's not in Iran's interest at all that there be any settlement uh, between Baghdad and Erbil, uh, particularly with respect to energy. Uh, and they'd love to see Iraqi energy production kept, kept down. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I, what I would think anyway. Uh, and so the question is what role can Iran or would Iran play and basically interfering with uh, any kind of uh, settlement uh, between Baghdad and Erbil. And if things go, second question, if things go as they have for the last many years, and I was working on this issue as far back as 2009, let's say there is no resolution, what happens as far as what, what, what's your best prediction is what will happen with respect to energy production? Can it continue to grow? Okay, who'd like to who'd like to jump on this yeah. one? The Iranian angle first. <clears throat> well, I, I don't see um, my humble opinion. I don't see uh, Iran would uh, kind of like work in, in in not seeing any kind of like reconciliation between Erbil and Baghdad. I think Iran uh, will work very hard to reconcile between the two parties. The involvement of Iran in Iraq is not because. Um, from one side as like Iran is very much interested to play a significant role in Iraq. But if you look at like all the parties, let it be like the Sunnis, the Kurds or the Shia are maintaining a very balanced and strong ties with Tehran. And uh, most recently, like we see like the, 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 the recent visits and delegation from Kurdistan, the Sunnis always, the leaders, the Sunni leaders that always maintain, uh, especially the, the Islamic party and so on, a, a stable relationship with, <coughs> with Tehran. Now, whether the, uh, this uh, kind of like reconciliation happen or not between Baghdad and Erbil, uh, I think both parties will be forced to find a, some sort of uh, conclusion uh, to put an end to it, because uh, sooner or later it will backfire on both parties. The, the, the debts are piling, and the instability on both, uh, it's, uh, it will compromise any future investment. Uh, so, and, and this is, will be kind of like the, the pressure factors. Uh, the ones that achieved, and this is, we can go in like into details and strategies of how best to, to resolve this. And there are many options, uh, provided they all adhere to kind of like a unified constitutional dictation or interpretation. Uh, they, um, a solution will be achieved, uh, and, and production then by that time uh, will move um, and, and um, increase uh, state share. 
Um, one thing I would, I would uh, see is that the stumbling issue between Baghdad and Erbil is the significant debt and KRG, which could be anything around between 22 to 25 billion US dollars. And this uh, need to be kind of like assessed carefully without uh, above board uh, full auditing between, um, uh, at a federal level on these debts. I think it's going to be quite challenging to settle that or to even consider de de negotiating uh, these debts because these loans external and internal uh, ones um, have been taken on a unilateral decision by the KRG and not uh, approved at federal level. Thank you. Hadith, uh, yeah, do, you, do you see any, uh, any particular Iranian interest in suppressing uh, no, so, Iraqi so oil I, production? I agree with you. I, I don't think the Iranians have an interest in preventing a deal between uh, Kurdistan and uh, Baghdad but they have an interest in knowing which type of deal that, that could be reached between the two sides. Uh, if it is a deal that is strengthening Baghdad and uh, making sure that Kurdistan uh, will not be an ally of what uh, parties that Iran consider enemies, probably the Iranians will be open to support that. Um, uh, one thing that is important about this issue of uh, Baghdad and Erbil relations is that uh, we could talk a lot about what are the institutional legal frame uh, changes that need to be done in order to make those relations workable and satisfactory for the two, pa two parties. But from the experience of the, of the last decade, uh, the, the main issue is the lack of political will. Uh, there, uh, the, 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 there is a constitution but it, it was always power relations that, uh, that forced uh, a certain interpretation of this constitution. So when Kurdistan was strong, uh, in a stronger position and Baghdad was weak, Kurdistan imposed, uh, Kurdistan government imposed its own interpretation of the constitution, whether by contracting oil companies, building a pipeline with Turkey, or controlling oil fields in Kirkuk uh, after 2014. And when Baghdad became stronger, in, uh, it tried to impose its own interpretation uh, to, the, uh, to the Constitution and uh, asking Kurdistan to unconditionally accept this interpretation. And unless the two parties, probably encouraged by international community, by regional powers, push towards realizing that it is important to find a better framework than just relies, uh, relying on de facto politics and power relations, then this will continue for, for a long time. Thank you. So I think to, to kind of comment on the energy question vis-a-vis -vis Iranians' views on Iraqi oil and gas development, I mean, there's kind of two camps out there that you, as you talk to people, you can get both sides. And one of them is, is to a certain extent this idea that maybe Iran would like to exert greater influence over the Iraqi oil sector in particular, because at the end of the day, if you have a more intertwined uh, relationship between the two, you have an amount of production capacity that could rival Saudi Arabia's in kind of leadership of OPEC. And that's sort of one narrative that exists. Um, another one is that, of course, as Iraq's production increases and Iran continues uh, to, to not quite see the investment and the production increases that it thought it might see, due in part to lingering uncertainty over the position of the US. Um, that they look at Iraq as a rival. Um, I think one particular area that this is quite interesting is in the gas sector, because at the end of the day, uh, Iraq is actually Iran's second largest gas export market at the moment, and Iran's largest export market for gas is Turkey. So if you're talking about Iraq developing the potential to meet its domestic needs or export, um, and you know one of the, the plans that's certainly been talked about, particularly with the announcement of Rosneft last, uh, late last year, um, if, if Turkey is a market of interest, then you not only have uh, potentially Iran losing a market in Iraq, but also competition in its main market at the moment. So uh, I think there are, there are those out there that say there's some degree of influence, whether it's for cooperation or because of competition. Uh, I suppose it's an open question. Thank you. We had a question here. Yes, sir. Just wait for the mic. <laughs> Ambassador, thanks very much, and thank you uh, for the panel for your comments. 
Um, I wish I shared your optimism on the next threat not being a sort of a counterinsurgency one. Uh, and that sort of brings me raw onto Western Iraq, whereas obviously we celebrated that once before with the defeat of AQI and said we shouldn't let this happen again. We had developments occurring with contract signs, especially on our cash, and bring back to the mm -hmm. gas sector. Uh, and we said we won't let that happen again. Now we've eradicated Daesh uh, from that area again. But what's happening to develop that um, energy sector in Western Iraq to the benefit of the population of Western Iraq to make sure that doesn't happen again? Now, of course, that might play back into Ellen's last comments about where that gas then goes, bearing in mind that pipeline goes west across the border into Syria, which is another issue entirely. Terrific question. Anybody? Uh, yeah. So you could call me anything, but don't call me optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I mean, the defeat of ISIS probably created some atmosphere to be optimistic, but we should be, be also very careful and very cautious about it because uh, the wrong policies would, would also probably lead to uh, further problems, uh, security problems. We saw that already like, the, the uh, terrorist groups are changing their strategies. A few weeks ago, there were attacks uh, in Baghdad against civilians. So, and I think their, their agenda will be to prevent any stabilization of the situation in Iraq, any normalization. So uh, the Iraqi government should be vi vigilant and should make sure that uh, they will be able to counter any new strategy adopted by a terrorist. But there are some factors, like regional factors, for example, are different from uh, the, the, the context you were talking about in 2008, 2009. Now, th there are many uh, fronts for jihadists. You have Yemen, you have Libya, you have Syria, you have Sina. So I don't think Iraq is as attractive as it was before. It is still an attractive area for their operation. But at the same time, with the fight against them, with the development of the, uh, the, the capability of Iraqi forces, formal and informal forces, uh, uh, you see that Iraq is more prepared to, to face uh, this challenge without dismissing the fact that the wrong policies will probably uh, waste the, this, this, this uh, victory and the celebration that uh, came after the defeat of ISIS. So, what are the what are the right policies then, in this in this context, particularly with respect to Western Western Iraq? So, um, okay, uh, with respect to the Western Iraq, I think the wrong policies is uh, um, without uh, not to adopt uh, policies that build the trust in the communities. Like trust building is very important. And so far, not much has been achieved. Uh, we already saw uh, a random acts of retaliation uh, against people accused of cooperating or collaborating with ISIS, uh, extrajudiciary uh, uh, acts of, uh, by, by, by militias, by uh, local communities. This will, uh, will reproduce the tensions, uh, intercommunal and intracommunal, even within the same tribes, because there are, uh, there's a sense of revenge. Uh, also, uh, it's important to make sure that uh, it is not only about the security aspect. You, as I said, you, ha you, you have to have a holistic approach to, towards those areas in which the economic de development became, become central, and unfortunately, in those areas, as, as in other parts of Iraq, patronage politics are very do dominant. Uh, and they are, not, they, they, they are usually causing a huge waste of resources. Uh, most of the contracts don't go to the right place, don't be, uh, cannot, uh, are, not be, are not implemented in the right way. And uh, there's a, a, a huge, huge level of corruption. I recently met uh, an MP from Mosul, and she was complaining about the what has been adopted, like the, the, the project that has been that has been adopted to reconstruct uh, the old Mosul. Uh, and she she was accusing even international organizations of not being really aware of the of the damage and how to how to implement their own contracts. But then she said, we have the most corrupt local government. 
If you talk to people from Salah al-Din, many of them will, will say the same about, about their local government also, about the, the, the level of corruption uh, in the province. So you need also, I, I think for a long time, when it comes to Iraq state building, we focused a lot on inclusivity, on ethno-sectarian power sharing and making sure all communities are involved in the decision-making process. This hasn't worked. We, we neither got uh, an inclusivity nor effectiveness. I think in the, in, the, in the coming years, we need to focus on the effectiveness of the state building. Uh, I mean, here, here I remember a very good sentence by Samuel Huntington in one of his books saying that in, in, in societies going uh, through rapid changes, sometimes the type of governance doesn't matter as much as the degree of governance. And I, and I think Iraq needs a, a, a good degree of governance by making effective institutions, working rather than keep focusing on the identity-based uh, share uh, in power. Thank you, Louis. Yeah. Well, we talked earlier about the much-needed um, accountability by the um, Iraqi <laughs> officials to take things uh, seriously. And now I would like to highlight the much-needed accountability by the international community at, and the, the regional players. Um, <coughs> Iraq sacrificed a lot for the past four years uh, in terms of like defending the, the fault line between, between what is known as ISIS territory and the rest of the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, this cost Iraqis thousands of people that uh, gave their life from all the social fabric. Uh, it kind of like left behind 300, 3 million IDPs uh, at least and hundreds of thousands of casualties uh, that will remain a, uh, an issue for the uh, state to, to basically and um, in terms of like how to rehabilitate them and integrate them back to the, to the society. Also managing the expectation of those IDPs when they go back to the uh, sit ruined cities. Now, the international community and the regional uh, um, players basically really need to take this responsibility not as like uh, Okay, the, the, out of pitiness in terms of supporting Iraq. No, it's, this is this is a, this is sh they should take this uh, close to their national security. If Iraq falls again, it will the, the, the spillover of terrorism will engulf the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. And if they were worried about 30, 40,000 radicals, uh, for, foreign fighters moving into Iraq and Syria, they will have to deal with millions of un satisfied and upset people inside Iraq. And uh, Iraq alone cannot handle this. The international community is responsible to really take, put a, a serious plan of redeveloping Iraq, not kind of like because it's a poor country. No, no, it's, it's, it, it, this is a defense uh, um, a state that has to be it has to be dealt with carefully, otherwise it will backfire on all. And, uh, and, and for this, they really need to, um, of course, work in, in close coordination with the Iraqi government and use skilled um, consultancies and experts and so on to, to put a plan together. Should, money should not be thrown uh, unconditionally. This is the wrong, we, uh, the wrong uh, resolution. Uh, it, um, I think any kind of financial contribution should be tied closely and, and regulated by carefully drafted policies uh, and uh, move things forward. And I think the United States and the European Union could work hand in hand in driving such policy uh, uh, forward. And, uh, because if this doesn't happen, expect more billions of dollars will be um, wasted by like sorties and bombings and and uh, dealing with uh, with with different type of uh, radicalism or um, civil unrest um, in Iraq or Syria. Thank you. We have a we have a question right in the center here. This gentleman. 
Hi, my um, name is David Gregorian, uh, Policy Forum Armenia and former IMF desk economist on Iraq, uh, in charge of assisting the federal government in Iraq uh, with uh, putting together their budgets for 2007, 8, and 9. And, and a quarter of a uh, corruption study um, in, in oil sector. I uh, took quick questions to, I guess, all panelists. Uh, back in, um, in those years, we, in determining the share of uh, KRG's revenue, we would abide by the 17% uh, magic formula. I wonder if that formula is still in place and, and if the transfers have, are, are being made consistently according to that. Uh, and the second, formula, second question is that uh, when we Back then, when we thought about inefficiencies in in oil sector, uh, one area where we thought money is being left on the table was um, the lack of um, uh, refiner, you know, massive or, or sizable refinery uh, capacity in in Iraq, which uh, which led to significant imports of oil, which in in our determination was one of the key uh, areas of uh, corruption. I wonder if that has changed and if there are any plans of uh, building a refinery or refineries in, in Iraq. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, let's start with the, uh, the KRG 17%. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, please. The 17% the is very much kind of like misunderstood. Many commentators you hear like this is a constitutional right or whatever. It's kind of like a political arrangement um, um, back at the early days of, uh, of post the um, Bremer, or the, since uh, the, the cabinet of um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Sayyid Alawi. And, uh, and it's kind of like it's disputed whether it's a 12% or 17%, but what really kind of like required in Iraq is a proper census in terms of like the population and the, to have a, a revenue-sharing law in accordance to Article 106 of the Constitution to uh, rightfully distribute uh, the revenue-sharing pro rata to the population and the governors and so on and implement decentralization. Uh, without having this mechanism in place, these kind of like uh, disputes in terms of like claims of numbers is going to be, it will remain to be um, um, a point of contention between the, the various parties. Refining capacity? Yeah, so I think um, one of the interesting things you're also seeing at the moment in the region is a lot of the neighboring oil producers talk a lot about becoming more of a downstream operator, really developing out refining capacities and petrochemicals. And, you know, on the one hand, this is still, in my understanding, a shortage that Iraq faces. I mean, one of the, the points of the swap deal with Iran is sending it to a refinery across the border. Um, but on the other hand, in the context and face of so many other investment needs, um, prioritization is potentially something that's needed. And so at the end of the day, you know, you have a conversation in neighboring oil producers about economic diversification and downstream development. And uh, where we are now, you know, I, I'm not sure that Iraq is there, but mm -hmm. then again, um, the situation has presumably changed a bit from 2007, 8, and 9, but on the other hand, given the, the last couple of years, a lot of those challenges are still in place. Right. Yeah, just on the refining capacity, since the loss of uh, Beijing, yeah. uh, Iraq lost um, around 250,000 barrels of refined capacity, and this led the government to end up burning more crudes for um, power generation as well as uh, relying on importing an expensive liquid fuel uh, and, and um, expand their arrangement in terms of like gas imports and so on. Uh, this, I mean, at the end of the day, um, the, refining the refining sector in Iraq need to be completely revisited. Iraq will re uh, requires at least 1.5 million barrels of refined capacity uh, well utilized, providing the full set of products for, for the nation and also eventually to think of um, um, a potential of export capacity and, and to lock market share not only by crude but also by thinking of um, investing in, in refineries. Kuwait is, uh, is investing in Asia, so as Saudi Arabia and, and other countries and this is how we, you would lock market share not just by selling crude and it's also maximizing on um, commercial partnership with the uh, major consumers uh, of oil. Uh, now, for this to happen, the the, refi the refining investment law need to be um, corrected. Um, and uh, I've written a lot 
uh, advises to the parliament mm -hmm. to really kind of like um, make the, um, the, the federal law for finding much more appealing for investors and avoid writing percentage or numbers because for heaven's sake this is not a contractual document. They leave the government to do the negotiation and, and, and uh, deal with the flexibility of, of, uh, of these uh, investment portfolio. The, or the, the proposals. Uh, the, but unfortunately, the, 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 the uh, refining investment uh, law uh, is not helpful, and this needs to be corrected ASAP, and uh, the uh, um, Oil and, and, and Energy um, um, Committee in the, in the federal, uh, um, um, in Baghdad, uh, need to be kind of like assisted by some sort of international law, because apparently they don't listen to local experts. So. Thank you, sir. You had a question? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, hi, uh, Maya Hardiman from the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center. Uh, first, thank you guys. Uh, I thank all of you guys for um, a really fascinating, informative discussion. Um, I was curious to hear the opinions of perhaps all the panelists on energy alternatives to oil from Iraq, uh, especially given their stated intentions in September to hopefully pursue nuclear power. So I'm wondering first, uh, how feasible do you think it is for Iraq to pursue alternative energy in addition to investing in oil and gas? And second, how desirable do you think that would be? Okay. So on the nuclear side of things, I mean, one key concern would be the security question. There's, of course, a, a lot of different plans for nuclear development in the Middle East. It's capital intensive, it's technology intensive, um, and then it presents a host of security risks. So, you know, at the end of the day, it is a carbon-free source of baseload power, but it does require a fairly f highly functioning power grid to offtake that power, um, as well as uh, the sort of security conditions in place to ensure um, that, that that power and that power plant are managed safely. Um, as well as the, the capital investment. And I think a recurring theme throughout this conversation has been there are lots of areas of need, um, lots of investment to be made, and not necessarily enough funds to go around. So I think on, on nuclear, it would just be, yes, greenhouse gas emission free, um, but is the supporting infrastructure both on the kind of grid side and the security side in place? Um, and on renewables, I mean, I think there's a lot of gains to be made in Iraq and quite frankly around the Gulf in renewable deployment. If you look at some of the countries in the Middle East that have made the biggest gains, um, it's actually countries like Jordan. So, you know, with high levels of solar resources and perhaps uh, the opportunity to make something out of smaller grids and localized distributed generation, um, I see that as being a fairly large opportunity and somewhere where Western companies um, and perhaps technology transfer and a lot of know-how, especially from European countries as well, since we've talked about ways that the US, Europe, and the kind of transatlantic relationship can sort of bring their expertise to bear in the situation. Um, renewable deployment, particularly solar, strikes me as one of those areas. Anybody else? Yes. And Please. Just, just on the renewable side, I think the, the potential is, is humongous. It's there. It just requires the, the investment and uh, environment to be to be there in terms of welcoming the right uh, deals and expand more. I think the, 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 the renewable to power sector uh, will significantly improve not only like the environment and provide uh, the right um, uh, energy, the clean energy fuel, uh, but also will release uh, enough of the burned crude uh, for the uh, potential exports, also uh, it will um, release most of the a lot of gas potentially to um, to meet, uh, for example, petrochemicals and so on and, and potential exports. So the renewable is, is the way forward. But this, but for renewable environment, for a renewable investment environment to exist in Iraq, the the, the commercial uh, parameters, the, the the fiscal regimes that need to be adopted has to be competitive to what the, the GCS is. So the GCC has been uh, they've been offering. Uh, also, the, the in terms of like the um, the bureaucracies and and, and that uh, that need to be revisited to ha to help investors have an easy access and penetrating the the renewable uh, markets in Iraq. Thank you. We have a question right up front here. Uh, 
Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting discussion. Nice to see you again, Louis. Um, uh, I'm a little bit alarmed by what you said, Harith, about uh, the partnership and consensus policies have failed, that's true, but that we need to uh, have a centralization of oil policy. Centralization in Iraq has been catastrophic in the past, so in the atmosphere of mistrust, which everybody has acknowledged, it's very hard to see how centralizing oil policy could be successful. So you could take that as a question. And my other question really refers to the gentleman who said he worked at the IMF and something that Louis said as well, which is what is the role of the IMF and the World Bank if all of us in Iraq, KRG, Baghdad, we've all had the wrong policies, we're not listening to local advice, is there a role for the IMF and the World Bank to set about conditions that force all of us to do better in terms of the economic future of our country. Thank you. Thank you. Arath, why don't you start uh, with the uh, centralization yeah, issue? Yeah, so, no, I'm, I'm not calling for uh, centralization. Uh, I'm talking about effectiveness. Uh, I, I agree with you that centralization has many problems. I, uh, but I was particularly talking about the oil sector. Uh, and we have also the experience of decentralization of oil sector in which Kurdistan and Baghdad did not work together. And we had, uh, we had also disastrous consequences. So we need to find a balance between the need of uh, giving more authorities to the regional and provincial governments, especially uh, energy producing provinces and the center. Uh, at the end, Iraq has long history of being oil exporting country. So there, there was a system in a place that has been formed since the late 50s. And it has been working. I mean, despite all the problems that Iraq has been, has been facing in, in 2014, one third of the country was lost to ISIS. Oil continued to flow and to the, the production increased. So um, I'm just warning of the risk that if we go to further decentral decentralization without make, looking or focusing on effectiveness, we will, create, we will make the system more complicated and fractured. Even this advantage that we have as a, as a, as a, as a country with, with some kind of system uh, well, like relatively well established in, in, in producing and exporting oil, if this, uh, even this will, 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 be, will be lost. So yeah, there is, a, there is a, a balance need to be struck between the need for uh, decentralization and the need uh, for effectiveness. International financial institutions. Before touching on this, I would like to comment on the decentralization. I think <coughs> this, was, uh, this is an issue that was largely misunderstood in Iraq. Um, Federalism never been implemented properly in Iraq. Um, the, uh, although, especially on the on the on the energy sector, the there's a kind of like a misunderstanding in terms of like the rights between between the regions and pro pro producing provinces and and, uh, uh, and 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 the rights of the federal government. Although it's kind of like clearly defined in the constitution, but this is yet to be regulated uh, uh, by a federal law. And that's why uh, both parties took uh, uh, authorities on, uh, and, and, and started to issue executive orders mm -hmm. uh, um, without uh, unilaterally uh, and without um, any kind of like collaboration. Um, the, on the on the development side, I just wanted to say, like, I mean, according to Article Article 130 of the Iraqi Constitution, all. Legacy laws are valid until repealed or correct or um, uh, revisited or corrected, uh, updated by new federal laws. But this is this is yet to be done, and that's why Baghdad is strong in a stronger position, in in in, in maintaining their stance on uh, holding on centralism. Uh, constitutionally, it's very clear the the the, the power sharing and uh, and the distribution of power. However. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, the, the oil policies, uh, um, the, the, um, this needs to be carefully dealt with. Uh, what Iraq needs is a Federal Oil and Gas Council, uh, of which every single producing uh, region and, and province to be member of. 
and collectively uh, decide the energy policy at a federal level and not to go unilaterally because this will be much more costly and will lead eventually, uh, eventually into a, um, uh, a catastrophic uh, um, um, uh, ending such as the, the, the deaths and, 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 uh, and, and the cost of, of uh, um, badly defined um, um, oil and gas deals. Uh, on the export, it's clearly uh, defined that should be like at a federal level. However, on the, on the management of the oil sector, this should be kind of like uh, um, um, ha handled at regional level and pro pro provincial level, provided a full transparency and cooperation between the region, uh, producing regions and province and, and the federal government. On the IMF uh, um, issue, uh, the IMF maintained uh, their advice in terms of like the, um, to, um, to fix the issue of subsidies that used to cost Iraq over uh, something like 12 to 14 billion US dollars now with the oil prices uh, going down, um, unlike the hundred dollars plus, uh, much lower, but still um, costing the state a significant bill. Um, the, uh, there are uh, kind of like resolves uh, being suggested by the IMF in terms of like restructure of the budget and uh, and uh, curbing costs and so on. But what really was what the, the things that was not I did not see in the IMF report and let's slip my observation is that the the Iraqi government must put a cap on how much oil should be uh, oil revenue should be used to finance budget back in 2000 but uh, back in 19 in the early 1950s when the 50-50 agreement had mm -hmm. took place between between the monarchy and the and the seven sister the Iraq petroleum company and um, the Iraqi government started to enjoy um, like millions of dollars of revenues they established the development board and that development board kind of like uh, put a, a cap on like 70-30 formula where 30% uh, for operational expenditure for government, 70% goes into mega projects. In Iraq, what we really need to do is to put a cap on the, uh, on the oil uh, production. So I will say like, for example, 3.5 million oil revenues financing budget, any new oil should finance mega projects and sovereign wealth funds. Because what we are dealing with is also the rights of future generation, not just us. And, uh, and um, uh, the last thing what uh, Iraq, the, the current administrator, need to do is not to hold future generations hostage or liable for, uh, major, to deal with major challenges bigger than the ones that the current administrations are dealing with. Thank you. Uh, we've, hit the, uh, we've hit the witching hour here. I would just invite the panelists, if there are any, any, any last second, very brief interventions, anything uh, you'd like to say before we wrap up? Alan? So I think just to build on Louis's last point, because I opened a bit with the importance of, of oil and gas revenue, and I, I think the immediate near-term issue is how to make sure that immediate challenges and issues are resolved but that some of this revenue in some way is invested in mega projects, long-term projects, and economic diversification. Because I think the one thing that does stand out um, in addition to the scope of the, the challenge and the level of investment needed is really that a lot of other oil producers are reading the writing on the wall in terms of some of these technological issues that we're seeing and changes in, in oil and energy markets, which doesn't necessarily mean, as Lou, I mentioned, that, that, lo that oil is not going to be a part of our kind of energy mix going forward. Um, but it does mean its role could be less than we've seen in the past and that we may not see a return to prices that we've seen in the past. And so I think thinking through the immediate term needs, um, but also with an eye towards long term economic diversification is, is a really important uh, next step. Terrific. Alan, again, thank you for uh, congratulations on a superb report. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, investing some of your valuable time in us this afternoon. Please join me in uh, thanking this superb panel.